Chapter Eight, North and South. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell, Chapter Eight, Homesickness. It needed the pretty light papering of the rooms to reconcile them to Milton. It needed more, more that could not be had. The thick yellow November fogs had come on, and the view of the plain in the valley, made by the sweeping bend of the river, was all shut out when Mrs. Hale arrived at her new home. Margaret and Dixon had been at work for two days, unpacking and arranging. But everything inside the house still looked in disorder, and outside a thick fog crept up to the very windows, and was driven into every open door in choking white wreaths of unwholesome mist. Oh, Margaret, are we to live here? asked Mrs. Hale in blank dismay. Margaret's heart echoed the dreariness of the tone in which this question was put. She could scarcely command herself enough to say. Oh, the fogs in London are sometimes far worse. But then you knew that London itself and friends lay behind it. Here, well, we are desolate. Oh, Dixon, what a place this is! Indeed, ma'am, I'm sure it will be your death before long, and then I'll know who'll stay. Miss Hale, that's far too heavy for you to lift. Not at all, thank you, Dixon," replied Margaret coldly. "The best thing we can do for Mamma is to get her room quite ready for her to go to bed, while I'll go and bring her a cup of coffee." Mr. Hell was equally out of spirits, and equally came upon Margaret for sympathy. Margaret, I do believe this is an unhealthy place. Only suppose that your mother's health or yours should suffer. I wish I had gone into some country place in Wales. This is really terrible," said he, going up to the window. There was no comfort to be given. They were settled in Milton, and must endure smoke and fogs for a season. Indeed, all other life seemed shut out from them by as thick a fog of circumstances. Only the day before, Mr. Hale had been reckoning up with dismay. How much the removal and fortnight at Heston had cost, and he found it had absorbed nearly all his little stock of ready money. Not here they were, and here they must remain. At night, when Margaret realized this, she felt inclined to sit down in a stupor of despair. The heavy, smoky air hung about her bedroom. Which occupied the long, narrow projection at the back of the house. The window, placed at the side of the oblong, looked to the blank wall of a similar projection, not above ten feet distant. It loomed through the fog like a great barrier to hope. Inside the room, everything was in confusion. All the efforts had been directed to make her mother's room comfortable. Margaret sat down on a box. The direction card upon which struck her as having been written at Helston, beautiful beloved Helston, she lost herself in dismal thought. But at last she determined to take her mind away from the present, and suddenly remembered that she had a letter from Edith, which she had only half read in the bustle of the morning. It was to tell of their arrival at Corfu. Their voyage along the Mediterranean, their music and dancing on board ship, the gay new life opening upon her, her house with its trestled balcony, and its views over white cliffs and deep blue sea. Edith wrote fluently and well, if not graphically. She could not only seize the salient and characteristic points of a scene; she could enumerate enough of in. Discriminate particulars, for Margaret to make it out for herself. Captain Lennox and another lately married officer shared a villa, 
high up on the beautiful patipitous rocks overhanging the sea. The days, late as it was in the year, seemed spent in boating or land picnics, all out of doors, pleasure-sinking and glad. Edith's life seemed like the deep fault of blue sea above her, free, utterly free from fleck or cloud. Her husband had to attend to drill, and she, the most musical officer's wife there, had to copy the new and popular tunes out of the most recent English music for the benefit of the bandmaster. Those seemed their most severe and arduous duties. She expressed an affectionate hope that, if the regiment stopped another year at Corfu, Margaret might come out and pay her a little visit. She asked Margaret if she remembered the day twelve month on which she, Edith, wrote how it rained all day long in Harley Street, and how she would not put on her new gown to go to a stupid dinner and get it all wet and splashed in going to the carriage, and how at that very dinner they had met Captain Lennox. Yes, Margaret remembered it well. Edith and Mrs. Shaw had gone to dinner. Margaret had joined the party in the evening. The recollection of the plentiful luxury of all the arrangements, the stately handsomeness of the furniture, the size of the house, the peaceful, untroubled ease of the visitors, all came vividly before her, in strange contrast to the present time. The smooth sea of that odd life closed up, without a mark left to tell where they had all been. The habitual dinners, the calls, the shopping, the dancing evenings were all going on, going on for ever, though her Aunt Shaw and Edith were no longer there, and she, of course, was much less missed. She doubted if any one of that old set ever thought of her except Henry Lennox. He, too, she thought, would try to forget her because of the pain she had caused him. She had heard him often boast of his power of putting any disagreeable thought far away from him. Then she penetrated further into what might have been if she had cared for him as a lover and had accepted him, and this change in her father's opinions and consequences station had taken place. She could not doubt but that it would have been impatiently received by Mr. Lennox was a bitter mortification to her, in one sense, but she could bear it patiently, because she knew her father's purity of purpose, and that strengthened her to endure his errors, grave and serious, though in her estimation they were. But the fact of the world esteeming her father's degraded in its rough, wholesale judgment would have oppressed and irritated Mr. Lennox. As she realized what might have been, she grew to be thankful for what was. They were at the lowest now. They could not be worse. Edith's astonishment and her Aunt Shaw's dismay would have to be met bravely when their letters came. So Margaret rose up and began slowly to undress herself, feeling the full luxury of acting leisurely, late as it was. After all, the past hurry of the day, she fell asleep hoping for some brightness, either internal or external. But if she had known how long it would be before the brightness came, her heart would have sunk low down. The time of the year was most unpropitious to health as one well as to spirits. Her mother caught a severe cold, and Dixon herself was evidently not well. Although Margaret could not insult her more than by trying to save her or by taking any care of her. They could hear of no girl to assist her or were at work in the factories. At least those who applied were well scolded by Dixon for thinking that such as they could ever be trusted to work in a gentleman's house. So they had to keep a charwoman in almost constant employ. Margaret longed to send for Charlotte, but besides the objections of her being a better servant than they could now afford to keep, the distance was too great. Mr. Hale met with several pupils, who were recommended to him by Mr. Bell, or by the more imminent influence of Mr. Thornton. 
They were mostly of the age when many boys would be still at school, but according to the prevalent and apparently well-founded notions of Milton, to make a lad into a good tradesman, he must be caught young and acclimatated to the life of a mill or office or warehouse. If he were sent to even the Scottish universities, he came back unsettled for commercial pursuits. How much more so if he went to Oxford or Cambridge, where he could not be entered till he was eighteen. So most of the manufacturers place their sons in sucking situations at fourteen or fifteen years of age, unsparingly cutting off offshoots in the direction of literature or high mental cultivation, in hopes of throwing the whole strength and vigour of the plant into commerce. Still there were some wiser parents and some young men who had sense enough to perceive their own deficiencies and strive to remedy them. Nay, they were a few, no longer youths, but men in the prime of life, who had the stern wisdom to acknowledge their own ignorance, and to learn late what they should have learnt early. Mr. Thornton was perhaps the eldest of Mr. Hale's pupils. He was certainly the favourite. Mr. Hale got into a habit of quoting his opinion so frequently, and with such regard, that it became a little domestic joke to wonder what time during the hour appointed for instruction would be given to absolute learning, so much of it appeared to have been spent in conversation. Margaret rather encouraged the slight, merry way of viewing her father's acquaintance with Mr. Thornton, because she felt that her mother was inclined to look upon this new friendship of her husband's with jealous eyes, as long as his time had been solely occupied with his books and his parishioners, as at Halston, she had appeared to care little whether she saw much of him or not. But now that he looked eagerly forward to each renewal of his intercourse with Mr. Thornton, she seemed hurt and annoyed, as if he were slighting her companionship for the first time. Mr. Hale's overpraise had the usual effect of overpraise upon his auditors. They were little inclined to rebel against ostracized beings, always called the just. After a quiet life in a country parsonage for more than twenty years, there was something dazzling to Mr. Hale in the energy which conquered immense difficulties with ease. The power of the machinery of Milton, the power of the men of Milton, impressed him with a sense of grandeur, which he yielded to without caring to inquire into the details of its exercise. But Margaret went less abroad among machinery and men, saw less of power in its public effect, and as in happened, she was thrown with one or two of those who, in all measures affecting masses of people, must be acute sufferings for the good of many. The question always is, has everything been done to make the sufferings of these exceptions as small as possible, or in the triumph of the crowded procession have the helpless been trampled on, instead of being gently lifted aside out of the roadway of the conqueror, whom they have no power to accompany on his march? It fell to Margaret's share to have to look out for a servant to assist Dixon, who had at first undertaken to find just the person she wanted to do all the rough work of the house. But Dixon's ideas of helpful girls were founded on the recollection of tidy elder scholars at Helston School, who were only too proud to be allowed to come to the parsonage on a busy day, and treated Mrs. Dixon with all the respect and good deal of more fright which they paid to Mr. and Mrs. Hale. Dixon was not unconscious of this old reverence which she was given to her, nor did she dislike it. It flattered her as much as Louis the fourteenth was flattered by his courtiers, shading their eyes from the dazzling light of his presence. But nothing short of her faithful love for Mrs. Hale could have made her endure the rough, independent way 
in which all the Milton girls who made applications for the servant's place replied to inquiries respecting their qualifications. They even went the length of questioning her back again, having doubts and fears of their own as to the solvency of a family who lived in a house of thirty pounds a year, and it gave themselves airs, and kept two servants, one of them so very high and mighty. Mr. Hale was no longer looked upon as Vic of Helston, but as a man who only spent at a certain rate. Margaret was weary and impatient of the accounts which Dixon perpetually brought to Mrs. Hale of the behaviour of those would-be servants. Not by what Margaret was repelled by the rough, uncourteous manners of these people, not by what she shrunk from fastidious bride from their hale fellow cost, and severely resented their unconcealed curiosity as to the means and position of any family who lived in Milton and yet were not engaged in trade of some kind. But the more Margaret felt impertinence, the more likely she was to be silent on the subject, and at any rate, if she took upon herself to make inquiry for a servant, she could spare her mother the recital of her disappointments and fancied or real insults. Margaret accordingly went up and down to butchers and grocers, asking for a non pareil of a girl, and lowering her hopes and expectations every week, as she found the difficulty of meeting with any one in a manufacturing town who did not prefer the better wages and greater independence of working in a mill. It was something of a trial to Margaret to go out by herself in this busy, bustling place. Mrs. Shaw's ideas of propriety and her own helpless dependence on others had always made her insist that her footman should accompany Edith and Margaret if they went beyond Harley Street or the immediate neighbourhood. The limits by which this rule of her aunt's had circumscribed Margaret's independence had been silently rebelled against at the time, and she had doubly enjoyed the free walks and rambles of her forest life from the contrast which they presented. She went along there with a bounding, fearless step that occasionally broke out into a run if she were in a hurry and occasionally was stilled into perfect repose as she stood listening to or watching any of the wild creatures who sang in the leafy courts or glanced out with her keen, bright eyes from the low brushwood or tangled firs. It was a trial to come down from such motion or such stillness only guided by her own sweet will to the even and decorous pace necessary in two streets. But she could have laughed at herself for minding this change, if it had not been accompanied by what was a more serious annoyance. The side of the town on which Crampton lay was especially a thoroughfare for the factory people. In the back streets around them there were many mills, out of which poured streams of men and women two or three times a day, until Margaret had learnt the times of their ingress and egress, she was very unfortunate in constantly falling in with them. They came rushing along with bold, fearless faces and loud laughs and jests, particularly aimed at all those who appeared to be above them in rank or station. The tones of their unrestrained voices and their carelessness of all common rules of stress, politeness frightened Margaret a little at first. The girls, with their rough but not unfriendly freedom, would comment on her dress, even touch her shawl or gown, to ascertain the exact material. Nay, once or twice she was asked questions relating to some article which they particularly admired. There was such a simple reliance on her womanly sympathy with their love of dress, and on her kindliness, that she gladly replied to their inquiries as soon as she understood them, and half smiled back at their remarks. She did not mind meeting any number of girls, loud spoken and boisterous though they might be, but she alternately dreaded and fired up against the workmen who commented not on her dress, 
reflected on her looks. In the same open, fearless manner, she who had hereto felt that even the most refined remark on her personal appearance was an impertinence, had to endure undistinguished admiration from these outspoken men. But the very outspokenness marked the innocence of any intentions to hurt her delicacy, as she would have perceived if she had been less frightened by the disorderly tumult. Out of her fright came a flash of indignation, which made her face scarlet and her dark eyes gather flame. She heard some of their speeches, yet there were other sayings of theirs which, when she reached the quiet safety of home, amused her even while they irritated her. For instance, one day, after she had passed a number of men, several of whom had paid her the most unusual compliment of wishing she was their sweetheart, one of the linguists added, Your bonny face, my lass, makes the day look brighter. And another day, as she was unconsciously smiling at some passing thought, she was addressed by a poorly dressed middle-aged workman with, You may well smile, my lass. Many a one would smile to have such a bonny face. This man looked so careworn that Margaret could not help giving him an answering smile, glad to think that her looks, such as they were, should have had the power to call up a pleasant thought. He seemed to understand her acknowledging glance, and a silent recognition was established between them. Whenever the chances of the day brought them across each other's paths, they had never exchanged a word, nothing had been said, but their first compliment, yet somehow, Margaret looked upon this man with more interest than anyone else in Milton. Once or twice on Sundays, she saw him walking with a girl, evidently his daughter, and if possible, still more unhealthy than he was himself. One day Margaret and her father had been as far as the fields that lay round the town. It was early spring, and she had gathered some of the hedge and ditch flowers, dog violets, lesser celandines, and the like with an unspoken lament in her heart for the sweet profusion of the south. Her father had left her to go into Milton upon some business, and on the road home she met her humble friends. The girl looked wistfully at the flowers, and acting on a sudden impulse, Margaret offered them to her. Her pale blue eyes lightened up as she took them, and her father spoke for her. Thank you, Miss Bessie. I'll think a deal of them flowers, that who will, and I shall think a deal of your kindness. You're not of this country, I reckon. No, said Margaret, half smiling. I come from the south, from Hampshire, she continued, a little afraid of wounding his consciousness of ignorance if she used a name which he did not understand. That's beyond London, I reckon, and I come from Burnley ways, forty miles to the north, and yet, you see, north and south has both met and made kind of friends in this big smoky place. Margaret had slackened her pace to walk alongside of the man and his daughter, whose steps were regulated by the feebleness of the latter. She now spoke to the girl, and there was a sound of tender pity in the tone of her voice, as she did so that went right to the heart of the father. I'm afraid you're not very strong. No, said the girl, nor never will be. Spring is coming, said Margaret, as if to suggest pleasant, hopeful thoughts. Spring nor summer will do me good, said the girl quietly. Margaret looked up at the man, almost expecting some contradiction from him, or at least some remark that could modify his daughter's utter hopelessness. But instead he added, I'm afraid who speaks truth. I'm afraid who's too far gone in a waste. I shall have a spring where I'm bound to in flowers and amaretts and shining roses besides. Poor lass, poor lass, said her father in a low tone. I'm none so sure out that, but it's a comfort to thee, poor lass, poor lass, poor father, it'll be soon. Margaret, shocked by his words, shocked but not repelled, rather attracted and interested. 
Do you live? I think we must be neighbours. We meet so often on this road. We put up at nine Francis Street, second turn to the left, at after you've passed the Golden Dragon. And your name? I must not forget that. I'm none ashamed of my name. It's Nicholas Higgins. Who is called Bessie Higgins? What are you asking for? Margaret was surprised at this last question. For at Helston, it would have been an understanding thing, after the inquiry she had made, that she intended to come and call upon any poor neighbour whose name and inhabitation she had asked for. I thought I meant to come and see you, she suddenly felt rather shy of offering the visit, without having any reason to give for her wish to make it. Beyond a kindly interest in a stranger, it seemed all at once to take the shape of an impertinence on her part. She read this meaning, too, in the man's eye. I am none so fond of having strange folk in my house. But then, relenting as he saw her heightened colour, he added, you are a foreigner, as one may say, and maybe don't know many folk here, and you've given my wench here flowers out of your own hand. You may come if you like. Margaret was half amused, half nettled at this answer. She was not sure if she would go where permission was given, so like a favour conferred. But when they came to the turn into Francis Street, the girl stopped a minute and said, You'll not forget, you're to come and see us. Ay, ay, said the father impatiently. You'll come. You're a bit set up now, because you thinks I might have spoken more severely. But who will think better on it and come? I've read her proud, bonny face like a book. Come along, Bess. There's the mill bell ringing. Margaret went home, wondering at her new friends, and smiling at the man's insight into what had been passing in her mind. From that day Milton became a brighter place to her. It was not the long, bleak, sunny days of spring, nor yet was at that time was reconciling her to the town of her habitation. It was that in it she had found a human interest. End of chapter 8